We're going to get started. Looking forward to continuing in the, in the Fear of God series, and this morning we're going to be focusing on the fear of God in marriage, the fear of God in marriage. And let's just begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for giving us a Lord's Day where every, every week, the very day of the week that you, Lord Jesus, rose from the dead, we can gather as your church, we can worship you, we can encourage one another, we open up your word to, as, as really as the greatest aspect of worship, and this morning I pray that as we look at your word regarding what it says about marriage, I pray that it would renew our minds so that we might think about you and marriage properly. Lord, if there is anything that more, more practical, if there's, there's nothing more practical, I should say, Lord, we know that fearing you is the most practical, uh, fundamental element of a marriage that honors you and a marriage that brings to, true joy. And so, for everyone here, whether they are married or single, I pray that this study would be a benefit in order to think rightly about fearing you, uh, particularly in this relationship of human marriage. And Lord, thank you for the clarity of your word, and um, I do pray that this would become um, a benefit for husbands and wives, for uh, those who are single, for the kids, for those who are older, those who are empty nesters. And in every um, stage in between, I pray that we would think rightly about this simply so that you might be glorified, simply so that we might benefit others and be an encouragement to one another. And I pray that as we learn this truth, the conversations that take place in this congregation, the, the one another's, the fellowship, the, the admonishment, the encouragement, um, as we help those who are weak, as we encourage the faint-hearted, as we admonish the unruly, that we would be skilled and adept at taking all of the issues that flow and usually show themselves in the difficulties and the tensions of a marriage relationship, that we'd be able to take those back to the fundamental foundation of fearing you. And so, Lord, we thank you again for this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, the fear of God in marriage, I've already mentioned in my prayer, there's really nothing more relevant, more foundational to a happy marriage than the fear of the Lord. Um, it might be helpful, though, to kind of make a list of things that we might view as important in our homes. Um, what priorities would we have for a, a godly home? What priorities would we put on our homes or in our marriages? Um, and let me give you a list of, of some that um, might be what we call distracting priorities. Priorities that we might tend to have at times, but ought not to be priorities. This list would be things that we can find ourselves really raising to the top of the list as of importance, and um, really we would regret doing so if this became the, uh, the, the number one priority for our homes or our marriages. Number one, giving my children the best education. Of course, this is not a biblical priority, although, of course, there are wise, wise godly reasons for thinking about um, education and, and how we train up our children. Number two, helping them excel at sports or activities or practical skills. Uh, this is certainly a priority that if it became number one, it, we would regret. Number three, financial stability. Now, of course, we could also point to various scriptures and show that Particularly for us as men, uh, providing for a family, that's a, uh, that is a priority. But what I'm getting at here is financial stability at all costs. That, of course, will become an idol that would, we would regret. Number four, a home that fosters progress. We might look at the raising of our children, and we might think about our marriage, and we might think about what we want to characterize our home, and we might really get excited about a home that is productive, just we get stuff done, we're diligent, there's productivity, there's industry, there's, there's progress in our home. And of course, if that became the priority at all costs, we would regret that as a priority. 
Number five, maintaining appearances. Now, this is one that we probably would never really list, but it can become a priority, a practical priority in our home. Uh, when we become very concerned about the way that our children appear, the way that our marriage appears, the way that we appear in our home to other people, and suddenly appearances and then even comparisons to others' appearances becomes part of our lives. That would be tragic. Of course, we, you know, I've, I've never fallen prey to this, but I've read about people who have, and um, uh, I only had to go back uh, a few years to remember some, some very, very uh, humorous, humorous uh, anecdotes about trying to maintain appearances. And, you know, my wife would, you know, she's a phenomenal host and a phenomenal uh, wife, and she takes pride in hospitality. And, and uh, you know, I remember one time we were walking out of church it was shortly after we, were, we had taken the pastoral role at the church where I served before I was here. And, and uh, Pastor Jerry and Louise were walking out of the church right when we were. And uh, it was one of those, it was like a, unheard of Sunday afternoon where we didn't have any plans and they didn't have any plans and we just started chatting in the parking lot and we just said, well, why don't you guys come over? And, and uh, I, prob- I probably just threw it on April. She didn't prepare for it. She wasn't prepared. So we go home and <clears throat> look in the fridge in the minutes before they pull into the driveway and uh, we found some apples, <laughs> some cheese. <laughs> So we gave him everything we had, and we shared it to the glory of God. And uh, my wife you know, was, was cringing at what she felt like was a lack of hospitality. I consider it a golden hospitality because I sprung it on her. But you know what happens when you, ha- when you raise kids? The same thing happens. You can't possibly keep appearances. Suddenly, uh, real life catches up to you, and that's a, a grace of God to expose uh, appearances that sometimes we tend to want to keep because we imagine that if we look successful, that actually constitutes success in our homes. Six would be very similar, getting kids to behave a certain way. Of course, that could be because of appearances, but that also could just simply be because of, for our own sakes, for the externalism and for ease of life, if they would just conform to what we've called them to do and to be. And this really, as it, when this becomes a priority in the home, the home's going to be marked by moralism externalism, it's going to be exasperating, it's going to produce hypocrisy. And of course, we're all naturally hypocrites. We're not talking about making your children hypocritical. We're talking about promoting it. And that's the problem. Number seven, <clears throat> cultivating a home life where children like you. Mm. If that becomes a priority, that becomes a problem, doesn't it? And of course, that's not to say Uh, that parents shouldn't be liked by children and parents shouldn't like children. That would be a problem if the other one of those weren't true. But when that becomes a priority, that becomes an idolatry. Number eight, tyranny of the current. Uh, Sometimes we think about the tyranny of the urgent where urgent demands kind of take over our calendar and we can't really plan for what might have been a priority. It seems like what happens often in, 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 in homes, though, whether it's, we're talking about the marriage or whether we're talking about uh, parenting, either one, um, what seems to take over the calendar quite often is just tyranny of the current. In other words, it's just the way we've done it, and we put it on the calendar, and it's just it's like a, it takes an act of Congress to change the direction and the tone and the, the pace of the home. And so the tyranny of the current can often rule and take over what ought to be biblical and godly priorities. Instead of that list, I came up with maybe, hopefully, a better list, a better list of priorities in the marriage and a better list of priorities for the home. And, uh, and the reason why I'm kind of speaking about marriage and parenting interchangeably is my, my plan is that this week we're going to focus on marriage, next week, Lord willing, we'll focus on, on parenting. But here's a list of priorities that I think would be, you would probably want all of these on your list. Number one, teaching your children the scripture. That's going to be a priority for your marriage and your home. For anybody who's even read Deuteronomy 6 and understand the pattern of what a parent ought to be for their children. Number two, modeling godliness in your home. Number three, hospitality. Number four, love. Number five, practicing the one another's. Number six, commitment to church. 
Number seven, discipline and instruction in the Lord. Number eight, simply spending time together. Number nine, serving the saints. And I made this list because I thought these are going to be inarguably godly priorities. Priorities we would all want. And when I look at that list, there's one fundamental issue that's behind it all. The fear of God and trembling at his word. Without the fear of the Lord, we cannot possibly be faithful. We cannot possibly be successful with success as defined by God in either our marriages or in our homes. Either as a spouse or as a parent, we cannot be successful. The fear of God is fundamental to all things, as we've talked about, for life and godliness, for success in living a life of practical wisdom. And the same now is true when we look specifically in, at marriage or at parenting. So let's look at a couple of examples. Let's start in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, this becomes very patently clear in the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, Moses writes in verse 1, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God. I mean, the goal here is generational fear of Yahweh. Generational fear. Fathers and sons and grandsons would fear the Lord. That's the goal of the instruction. That's the goal of God's giving his word. That's the goal of parents teaching it to their children is so that we would fear him. Then continues verse 2, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may g- multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of our, your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. All of this is about the fear, fear of the Lord. It flows out of the fear of the Lord. Skip down to verse 24. Notice the goal of this. Verse 24 says, So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. God wants us to speak about this. this the word of righteousness ought to be the, the fabric of conversation in our marriage and our parenting. Because God wants what's best for us, which is a great reason to fear the Lord. Fear God because he's so good. We should be utterly concerned about what he thinks because he's that good. He is so good and so kind, so get busy fearing the Lord. And here, of course, it's the context of speaking the word as revealed by God in our marriage and in our our homes. Now skip over to um, Psalm, Psalm 127 and 128. In the Psalms, we have back-to-back Psalms that describe the fear of the Lord as utterly critical for the welfare of the home, and I want to look at this as well. Uh, again, these are, these are still kind of introducing both weeks, both fear of God in, our, in marriage and fear of God in parenting, but we're going to quickly turn our attention to, to marriage. But just to set the tone here, it's worth looking at Psalm 127 and 128 once again. In 127, we have a psalm where it describes the utter futility of applying all of our physical and fleshly and carnal effort into making a marriage or a home what we want it to be if the Lord does not cause the growth. So think about this. This is why fear of the Lord is so fundamental for a godly marriage or godly homes. 
because verse 1 is true. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. What a sweet picture that is. Okay, uh, Solomon gives us two pictures. He pictures a, a, a building of a house, so it is a construction imagery, and then he has the military imagery. So building the house and then watching the city, so keeping watch. In the construction imagery, imagine putting all of your effort into the construction. You, you, you've saved, you, you've, you've hired the right architect, you've, you've got all the materials assembled, and, and you've just, you have a, a, a punch list of how you're going to work it through in, in timely fashion, and you just have it all mapped out, and it's all planned out, and you are tireless in your efforts, and you are going to make it happen. But the Lord's not in it. You can spend your whole life trying to get that structure up, and it's going to be vain, wasted, if the Lord has determined this house isn't going to get built. <laughs> what matters is the Lord. The second imagery here is military, and the imagery specifically is the watchman. So you've got the scout on lookout during the night watch, watching the horizon, watching for the army, and you can have all the watchmen you want, but when the Lord has determined that the army's going to take over or lay siege, it's going to happen, as we talked about recently even with Daniel, I mean, in the book of Daniel, when Belshazzar is ruling and his He's with the confidence that, uh, no, I'm, I'm a king of many nations and no one can overturn my, my rule. And uh, then the Medes and Persians snuck in through, the, through the, the, the river that they had dammed off and diverted to other tributaries. And then they just marched in, killed the king, and took over and ended a world superpower overnight. If all of the watchmen are employing all of their effort, they cannot possibly su successfully guard the city unless the Lord is in it. So unless the Lord guards, unless the Lord builds, all of the guarding and all of the building is vain. We can do, we can give 110% to make our marriages what we want them to be. We can give 110% to make our families what we want them to be. Unless the Lord builds, unless the Lord guards, we produce and labor and try to accomplish family life in vain. It's vain to rise up early. It's vain to retire late, to be, eat the bread of painful labors. He gives to his beloved even in his sleep. You know, and I just, just think it's appropriate to comment here on Solomon's inspired words and just to say, you know, it's just, it's interesting how the human heart will manufacture so many idols when it comes to marriage. We'll manufacture so many idols about what we want marriage to be for us, what we want to get out of marriage, how we want to feel in marriage, what we think it should accomplish, what the fruit of it should be, what people should look at us and esteem us for in, our, in light of our own marriage. There, there's just a thousand and one opportunities for idolatry when it comes to our marriages. And then, of course, our parenting as well. And wherever those grip a heart, we are going to labor and strive with fanatical zeal to make sure that it happens the way that we want. And we do that in a carnal way, and it is vain, Solomon says. Verse 3, look, children are a gift of, of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. I mean, here it just describes, this is a gift of God. This is something that God gives. And so rather than trying to create a marriage or create a home life like we want according to our fleshly ideals and our fleshly expectations, it's important that we fear the Lord and long for our marriages to be what God wants them to be, and our home life to be what God wants it to be. That's the foundation for godly marriage and godly home. He gets explicit 
in the next psalm, assuming it's still Solomon. Verse 1, How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. And so notice, the fear of the Lord now is a refrain for this stanza. Skip down to verse 4. Behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Verse 1 is talking about fear of the Lord. Verse 4 is the fear of the Lord. And it's talking about this blessing, particularly in the home. Verse 2, when, when you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children like olive plants around your table. <clears throat> this imagery is incredible. Agricultural imagery, the metaphor, it becomes very obvious. At least the wife's metaphor is very obvious. We can all relate to uh, a fruitful vine. It, it's, when, when you have a vine that's fruitful, I mean, it's like it just produces and produces and produces, and it's just, you, you, it's just amazing it, it, what, what it gives out for such little effort. We have, this, um, we, have a, we have a grapefruit tree on one side of our house, and we have an orange tree on the other side of the house. Apparently, the orange tree is on the wrong side of the house. The grapefruit tree is on the right side of the house. Because uh, this last winter, I think we got about uh, a handful of oranges, and we probably we got bucket after bucket after bucket of grapefruit, and it was just incredible thing, watching this grapefruit tree produce. I mean, it just it just keeps going, and he describes the spiritual fruitfulness, the spiritual benefit of a wife in a home that fears the Lord comparable to that agricultural picture. In a home that fears the Lord, the wife's influence is of incomparable fruitfulness. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. And your children like olive plants around your table. And that one's not quite as easily accessible. But if you've been to, you might say like, yeah, it really hurt when you rub up next to them. I mean, what, what is the point of an olive branch being around my table? Well, if you've been to Israel, you, 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 you know, you've seen those olive groves. And if you've been to Gethsemane, the traditional site of Gethsemane, you know, um, all along that, that western hill there of Mount of Olives, you'll see those, those olive trees. And um, some of those olive trees are, are possibly uh, 2,000 years old. I mean, of course, there was the siege in 70 under, Caesar, under uh, General Titus. So, of course, any of those could have been cut down for, for you know, military purposes and that sort of thing. But you understand, very, it's actually possible that some of those olive trees that are still there, that are still living, and are still producing today, were there when Christ walked the earth. And there's just a longevity and a stability and a fruitfulness that goes with that olive plant. He's talking about the stability of the next generation it's, still, it's stable, and it endures, and it becomes a blessing. The spiritual imagery, of, of the, the, the agricultural imagery of, of wife and children becomes the spiritual reality for the wife and children in a home where God is feared. And so the fear of the Lord is the refrain for this kind of home. Uh, to finish the psalm, verse 5 says, The Lord bless you from Zion... May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Indeed, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. And of course, that is the mark of peace upon Israel is when generationally each generation is fearing the Lord. And that will be the mark of Israel. Fear of the Lord grounds all godly homes. Let's just focus for this morning, for the remaining of our time on marriage. Husbands, do you fear the Lord? I mean, Psalm 128 could not be more compelling for us, can it? You think about, there's going to be a direct correlation on the fruitfulness of your wife and the stability of your children to your fear of God. Um, that's attractive, it's compelling. It's sobering. Let's be frankly honest, it's terrifying. As men, speaking of the men here at GBC, your potential impact on the effectiveness of this church is massive because your potential influence for the effectiveness of your home is massive. Men, 
as goes your fear of the Lord, so goes your marriage. I mean, it's just, I don't know how to put it any more simpler than that. There's a direct correlation to between our fear of the Lord and the state of our marriage. And of course, I don't mean the experience of our marriage. The experience of your marriage is two sinners who have committed to one another in an agreement. And so, the experience of your marriage might actually get worse if you fear the Lord. That's quite possible. But what I'm talking about is the influence and effectiveness and success of your marriage as viewed by God. And so regardless if you're married to a believer or an unbeliever, men, the success of your marriage is directly tied to your fear of the Lord. Obviously, a wife and a husband equally can sin in a marriage. No one's doubting that. But it's also true that the husband holds the responsibility for the marriage. That goes all the way back to the way God designed it. You can read, go back and read the account in Genesis 1 and 2, and then read the account in Genesis 3. Uh, God gives the command to Adam. He creates Adam first. He passes that command on through Eve, to Eve through Adam. And then when God shows up, he seeks out Adam for the account. Men are responsible for the state of their marriage. So a hus- husband sins, is he culpable for his sin? Yes. If a wife sins, is she culpable for her sin? Yes. No matter what the equation, the man is responsible for the marriage. We've all been made aware in our marriages of decisions that we've made as husbands that were wrong. And um, whenever we make a mistake, it's like Adam's response is just hardwired into our fallen genes, isn't it? Uh, Something else. It's the circumstance. This woman. This complication over here. Uh, Anything but me. Do we fear the Lord? This has to be a priority. Men, the fear of the Lord is the foundation for all masculine leadership in the home. Without fearing the Lord, you will lack courage, you will lack conviction. But with it, you'll fear God, you'll worship God. The fear of the Lord will permeate every decision you make, every stand that you take, every sacrifice that you make for the welfare of people who look to you for, their, for care and for influence and for guidance and direction. If you fear the Lord, this is going to raise your leadership to a degree of usefulness never seen before. The people under your influence, if you fear the Lord, will flourish with spiritual fruitfulness, spiritual usefulness. There will be a protection, protection for your wife, a protection for your children. There will be a hardwired, built-in model and pattern that doesn't cross lines that might be attractive to a wife and attractive to children that you just drew a hard and fast black line around because of your own godliness. That is, that is far and away more important than telling your kids the truth. Men, do you understand this? Do you understand how important it is to fear the Lord in your own lives? I mean, we've, we all know what it's like to be lacking for words, but we better not be lacking for example. You could be diligent to teach your kids the truth and make sure we read the scriptures and memorize passages together, and that's invaluable. That's critical as well. But the problem is that would actually be worse to do that without the modeling because we would be training our children and we would be modeling for our wives a level of hypocrisy that they often do not recover from. It's kind of like what happens if We keep telling our kids the gospel. We keep telling our kids the truth. We keep telling our wives how worthy Christ is of worship, but then in the quietness of our own lives and the privacy of the decisions that we make and when it comes to the priorities that we hold on our own marriage, we won't let go of selfish desires. And the marriage still exists to scratch our own itches and to serve our own selfish needs and wants. If we fear the Lord, 
This would constrain our, our efforts to focus on the needs of our wife, to understand our wife. When we don't understand our wives, or we can't um, understand or relate to their fears or their concerns, the fear of the Lord would force you in an attractive way to say, this is invaluable. I get to obey. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, live with my wife in an understanding way because that is what Christ deserves. He deserves my worship. And to be able to live with my wife in an understanding way, that's invaluable. Totally worth it. Where can I sign up? And suddenly, obedience in our marriage becomes a delight, a joy, a privilege. Wives, you knew I was going to ask you too. Wives, do you fear the Lord? If uh, if the husbands are called to lead by way of love and sacrifice, wives, you're called to submit with reverence Let's turn and look real quick at 1 Peter chapter 3. I already mentioned verse 7 because I was mentioning in my charge to the husbands. But let's go ahead and look at it. I want, I want everybody looking at it together here. So just to backtrack a bit, go back to verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7. You husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way. As with someone weaker since she is a woman. The command to live with our, our wives in an understanding way is, is di- made directly with the realization that women are not like men. And the distinction between women and men is actually uh, a critical component of this very command. Uh, the reason why men are called to understand women is because they are different. They are the fragile vessel. There is a delicacy about uh, women. Of course, it doesn't mean you know weaker in the sense that you know, just obviously... J- Generally, uh, men are stronger than, than women, but it's not as though uh, you know, some guy who happened to not be stronger than his wife, for whatever reason, uh, is somehow exempt from this verse. The point is, is that the command is, you're talking about a fragility, a fragility, talking about spiritually the way that God created men versus women. And we understand what it's like. You, men are leaders. We make decisions. We take a stand. We follow it through. I'm going to own it. And that's just the way we're wired. So that kind of burden of responsibility is hardwired into our genes. It's what we're created for. And um, that's not necessarily uh, the way that a woman is wired. There's a, there's a delicacy, a fragility to a woman. There's a sensitivity to a woman. And so the command is to understand her, to live with her in an understanding way. And show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. And so just to backtrack to our, my charge to you men, I wanted that verse in your mind as I'm challenging you to consider whether you fear the Lord because that's your charge. That should be your tireless charge. And when you fear the Lord, this becomes the most attractive, obedient option in your marriage. But notice those first few words there, in the same way. Well, that goes back to the wives. In verses 1 through 6, Peter addresses the wives. And so wives are going to ask you if you fear the Lord. And I also should point out in chapter 3, verse 1, as you know, it starts with the same words, in the same way. So verse 7, husbands in the same way as what? As the wives? Well, immediately yes, but ultimately no, because the wives themselves, it begins with in the same way. So chapter 3, verse 1, in the same way as what? Go back to chapter 2, verse 21 to 25. The example is Christ. Christ suffered for us. Verse 23, while being reviled, he didn't revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. This is sacrificial Willing submission to the will of God, regardless if he's exonerated, because he's entrusting all judgment to his Father. Verse 25, while we were continually straying like sheep, but now you've returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. So, 
he was doing this, this selfless, sacrificial love for us was while we were continually straining like sheep. So then, wives, here's your relationship to your husbands, regardless of how they treat you. Husbands, here's your obligation toward your wives, regardless of how they treat you. The example is Christ. The example here is Christ. So, women, your role is to revere your husband. And the example is Sarah. Chapter 3, verse 1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Of course, you would obey this because you obey the Lord. And that's always the case for a godly woman. A godly woman is going to obey the Lord. And so, obviously, there's an asterisk there, just like in Acts chapter 5, when the apostles say we'd rather obey God rather than men. Um, If a wife were in a situation where her husband is commanding her to disobey the Lord, a godly woman will always obey the Lord. But this is talking about submission to his leadership, obviously in amoral areas, not immoral areas. Amoral, just unbiblical, outside the realm of of Scripture. Just This is the way we're going to do it. Life and the home, and this is the direction we're going. But, but, but what if they don't obey the word? Doesn't matter. Submit to your own husbands, even if any of them are disobedient to the word, so that they could be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. And wow, if the fear of a if a fear of a man who's not fearing the Lord when he leads his wife, if, if there's a natural fear that I might not be respected by my wife. There's a natural fear in the woman. I might get burned submitting to his leadership. So submission to the leadership of a fallen individual is a very concerning prospect indeed. Verse 3, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses. And by the way, I'll just make a quick comment. I don't want to, I don't want to stop here, but just, just because we're here, uh, you know, NES has, a, has an italics right there on Merrily, and they're trying to, I think that's a helpful uh, addition to make, to try to clarify that this is not prohibiting some sort of external adornment, as though, as though there's no, uh, like, you're going to do something to your hair, and you're, you're going to wear something. So obviously, we all adorn ourselves before Sunday morning, uh, but actually, I kind of prefer, honestly, maybe with preaching exp- explanation, I do prefer a translation that just leaves it as is. Your adornment must not be external with the explanation of understanding what adornment is. Because the issue with adornment is what is most obvious and most compelling about you. In other words, it's not prohibiting some sort of aspect, like, like some sort of legalistic code about you know, what you can wear and what you, you know, whether you, you have how many braids and how many coils or whatever. It's not a code for externalism. It's prohibiting externalism being what adorns you. Your externals must not be your adornment. In other words, your spiritual character should outpace your externals. That's what's commanded here. So I kind of honestly prefer just... Skipping what's, what's added, I appreciate why they added it, but understanding what adornment really is, your adornment must not be external. What adorns you, what beautifies you, ought to be your character, not your externals. Verse 4, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. This is a term of respect. And you have become her children if you do what's right, without being frightened by any fear. Wow. So, women... Uh, wives, specifically, do you fear God? It'll manifest itself in a willful submission to your husband's leadership without fear. You say, that's pretty scary. Peter? Don't, I won't say John, because I didn't write it. Just, just reading Peter. Come on, Peter. That's pretty scary. You know, my husband's not perfect. How helpful that Sarah becomes the Poster girl. 
fearing God in marriage. Twice. Twice. Sarah's husband says, yeah, just tell him you're my brother or my sister. Because uh, he feared. He feared Abimelech. He feared what Abimelech might do if he thought, oh, that's his, that's his wife. We'll just kill Abraham and then I can have her because she was attractive. And so instead of being a godly leader, he was a very ungodly leader in those two incidences, the last one being Genesis chapter 20, and you can read about it. What does, what does Sarah do? She submits. She just follows his plan. She's like, okay. He's like, here's the leader that you gave me, Lord. In an ideal circumstance, he would have been selfless, sacrificial, and he would have protected me. But not in this case. So I'm in your hands. And she submits. And there she is in the palace and God sends a dream to a pagan so that she is not harmed. What profound protection of the Lord. Sarah did that without fear. I mean, we, we might think of Sarah, we might think of her laughing at the promise of God in Genesis 17 and 18. We, we might think of some of her lesser moments, but in Abraham's lesser moment is one of her greatest moments. What a profound display of faith and fearing God because she says, I'm in God's hands. All that matters is that I please the Lord. And this is where he's placed me. And God protected her by giving a pagan king a dream, revealing that she was a married woman, and so she was protected in spite of, in spite of her husband's failure in that moment. Consider in contrast... Wives, consider in contrast the difference between fearing God as a wife versus um, fearing man and relying on your own understanding in your marriage. The foolish woman in Proverbs 14. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish tears it down with her own hands. If you don't fear the Lord, you're going to think highly of your own insight and your own understanding, and that's a sure step toward tearing down your, own, your home with your own hands. Similarly speaking, the contentious woman is also a, a woman who's not fearing the Lord, and Solomon has much to say about that. Proverbs 19 Verse 13, a foolish son is destruction to his father, and the contentions of a wife are a constant dripping. Look also at 21.9, Proverbs 21.9, it is better to live in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Look at 25.24, Solomon continues, it's better to live on the corner of the roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. And then look at 27. Verse 15, a constant dripping on a day of steady rain and a contentious woman are alike. I mean, those are strong words. Comparing a nagging woman or a contentious woman to basically waterboarding. It just becomes like torture, Solomon says. And he makes this comparison saying, wow, a, a, a woman will wear a man out. And so, wives, think about this. If you're tempted to Rely on your own understanding. If you're tempted to not fear God, but fear man, you might resort to manipulation, nagging, quarreling, and trying to get your way. Well, husbands are constantly prone to not sacrifice self for the sake of a spouse and Wives are constantly tempted to manipulate and quarrel to get their way, but the fundamental conviction which gives hope to any marriage, regardless of your circumstance, regardless of who you're married to, regardless if they love the Lord or fear the Lord or love you or submit to you in return, the fundamental conviction which gives hope to any marriage 
is this. You always have the privilege of being pleasing to God. No matter what circumstance you're in, no matter how it's responded, no matter how it's, if it's reciprocated or not, you always have the privilege of being pleasing to God in your marriage. There is no circumstance that exists on God's green earth that you could be in where it's always a lose, 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 lose scenario. You always have a path and an open door toward pleasing God. It may not be comfortable. It might cost you tremendously. It might tug on, it might destroy your flesh. And who wouldn't rejoice in that? There is always, for the believer, there is always the opportunity to be pleasing to God. And this is your act of worship. This is what it means to fear the Lord. Again, I just want to repeat, I understand that some of you might be understanding these texts, and you might have applied these texts, you might, be, you might be living these texts, and in your own experience, it might produce more contention. It might produce more hostility. It might make the hostility more refined, more focused, and I understand that. So I'm not trying to say that this makes, makes everything easier. What I'm saying is that you always have the privilege of being pleasing to Christ, no matter how hard it gets. So here's, here's a syllogism. We could, we could use this syllogism. It's a biblical syllogism. This is logical, better than that, biblical logic about how to think about pleasing the Lord in marriage. Okay, you ready for this? Here's premise number one. Premise number one. We must think, as, as husbands and wives, we've got to think this way. God knows best how to glorify his name. Okay? Isaiah 48, 11, for my own sake, for my own sake, I act. How can I let my name be profaned? I will not give my glory to another. God's not an idolater. He never shares his glory, never has, he never will. He knows best how to glorify his name. So we're going to start with that premise, and this applies directly to marriage. Premise number two. God is sovereign and able to do whatever he pleases, whenever he pleases, wherever he pleases. Psalm 135, verses 5 and 6. His thrones are seated in the heavenlies. He does whatever he pleases in the sky, in the seas, on the land, and in all the deeps. God does whatever he wants. So, premise one, God knows best how to glorify his name. Number, premise two, whatever he wants to do, he does. <laughs> Conclusion, therefore, whatever providence you may be experiencing in your marriage right now, it might be bitter, it might be sweet, Whatever the providence that you're experiencing in your marriage right now, it might even, it might even, get this, this might blow your theological circuits, it might even be bitter because of your own doing, but whatever circumstances you are in right now, experiencing right now, are absolutely unimprovable for the purposes of your spiritual good and God's glory. Unimprovable. God has you exactly where you're supposed to be in the right circumstance, in the right scenario, with the right variables so that you can fear the Lord in the circumstance that you're in. And of course, if some of those variables and some of those circumstances are your own doing, that obviously involves repentance. But the point being that even the consequences that you've brought into your own marriage, maybe trust has been eroded and has to be rebuilt. Maybe there's a track record of bad habits that are particularly challenging for your spouse. Whatever the circumstances, where you're at right now is unimprovable for your ability to glorify the Lord. If there was another circumstance, another scenario that would have been better for you in your marriage, for God's glory or for your spiritual good, God would have done it. God desires to give us what's spiritually best for us, namely Christ-likeness, Romans 8. He's able and he's, he can do all that he wants and all that he's ordained, Ephesians 1.11. He works all things according to the, to the plan of his will. So therefore, your marriage fits in that massive scope of all things that God has designed for his own glory than that he has accomplished and brought to, to the precise point where you 
where you ought to be. So, I think I've made it clear, but I understand just again, there's not necessarily an equal sign between your worship of God and your, the state of your marriage, because in some cases, your worship of God has been the demise of the state of your marriage. But I am saying there is a direct correlation between your worship of God, your fear of God, and your being pleasing to the Lord in your marriage. Ultimately, the state of your marriage is a mutual responsibility between you and your spouse. But, but the fear of the Lord is everything. We have um, just a few minutes. Now, you know what? I don't think we have enough. Let me just leave you with a couple, uh, a couple of uh, encouragements. Let's close with Ephesians 5, and I'm going to give you some encouragement to think about the fear of the Lord out of Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5, as as you remember, this is a very familiar text for everyone, I'm sure. But this passage on marriage, properly beginning in verse 22, going through verse 33, is not a section, this is not an epistle for Paul to write about marriage. This is an epistle for Paul to write about the glory of God in saving sinners and creating a church for his own glory, and this just happens to be in a section that flows out of that kind of doctrine. So this section on marriage flows out of this command uh, in verse 15 through 18 to walk wisely, to redeem the time, and to be filled with the Spirit, to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So the command to marriage in verses 22 to 33 requires the Spirit's influence. This is what it means to be spiritual. Verse 22, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. In verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. These are your roles. Your roles don't require your spouse to fulfill their role. You can be obedient to your role regardless of your spouse. In fact, that's probably one of the most um, direct displays of the gospel is when a spouse actually obeys their role when the other spouse is deliberately not obeying their role. Because never could there be a greater parallel to Christ loving us while we were in our sins, while we were his enemies. So now I want to Make a man way back to a charge to the men. Let's look at verse 25 and following. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle uh, or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. So just, men, just as I said to the wives, wives, fear your husbands, submit to your husbands, revere your husbands, because Christ is worthy of that kind of worship. Husbands, Christ is worthy of your worship, so get busy loving your wife because Christ is worthy. Christ is worthy of your worship. And in verse 28 and 29, he makes the comparison between self-love and love for our wives. Not because we need a selfish motivation to love our wives, but he's just appealing to what's natural and innate to us all. If you have a member that's infected, you don't just say, oh, it's septicemia, no big deal. Might get to my heart tomorrow. Who cares? You don't say who cares. It's a natural self-love. So wives are members with us. We are one flesh. It's a one flesh union. And so love your wife because Christ loved the church. It's very appropriate to say, men, we cannot make a distinction between our love for Christ and our love for our wives. We could distinguish it in the sense that they're two different objects, but we can't separate it. You cannot imagine that you love Christ if you don't love your wife. 
and love your wife in a biblical way of sacrificial love for her sanctification. Pastor John MacArthur writes this, in the marriage relationship, you and your wife are one. And in salvation, your wife is one with Christ. So in a very real sense, the way you treat your wife is the way you are treating Christ. If you don't love your wife in a caring way, then you aren't caring for yourself and you don't love Christ as you should. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Husbands, wives, do you fear the Lord? All the benefits of a godly marriage, and as we hopefully look at next week, a godly home, flow out of fearing the Lord. Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for the reminder of how practical, how relevant the fear of the Lord is, even to uh, the relationships that um, affect us most dearly and most intimately and most closely, and that would be the relationships in our own family. Uh, Lord, we just want to come before you and pray that your spirit would bring great clarity and great conviction. Um, Lord, if, if we don't fear you the way that we ought, our marriages will be clouded and poisoned and contaminated with idolatry, the selfish desires, lusts and wants, or how we want things to go, or how we hope things will will be what they will mean for us or how, they will, how it will feel for us. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would grip us with fear of you. I, mean, I don't mean that in some sort of mystical way. It's not in some undefinable way. It's, it's, I pray that your word would be established as the very thing that would produce a very real reverence for you and that we would fear you to such a degree that we would hate worshiping anything in our hearts besides you. That whatever is ruining our marriage that would make it toxic or make it um, self-absorbed, that would make it less than you have designed it to be. I pray that the fear of you would cause us to hate that sin the way you do. Lord, cause us to hate the ways that our heart will go after self-significance, personal comfort, ease or laziness or whatever the case may be. We've all found ways to pursue self-significance in our marriages. And um, Lord, I just pray that you would eradicate that. Only a true fear of you, only seeing you rightly, only being more concerned about you, getting the glory that is due your name would cause us to repent and turn from these things. And so that's what we're praying for, Lord. We're praying that in our heart of hearts, you would reign supreme and help us now to trace out the ways that those wicked ways of thinking ways that we did not fear you, areas where we truly feared man or feared self, I pray that we would trace those out so that we could um, cut them off, that we could amputate um, any propensity that goes away from fearing you. And Lord, we long for the result of this, not to have, have nothing to do with, with ourselves or our own comfort or our own significance. We pray that it would have everything to do with your glory in our marriages and the spiritual benefit for our spouse. Give us that kind of selflessness, we pray, um, as we think about our marriages and next week as we think about our parenting. In your name we pray. Amen.